one of the big questions in modern physics is how do we reconcile Einstein's theory of relativity with quantum mechanics? Space-time itself is not a continuous thing, flat or curving. You can think of our sort of previous view of space-time as being this four-dimensional block of stuff that comes equipped with slicings into spaces at a time. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we could visualize extra dimensions? Wouldn't that be fantastic? What would it be like to see extra dimensions? The greatest of the British men, uh, one of the two, the other was William Shakespeare, I suppose, uh, Sir, uh, Sir Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton, um, has given us an extraordinary tool for dealing with, uh, uh, with reality. Uh, we still use Newton equations for building bridges and uh, uh, air plants and everything else, um, but especially has given us a vision of what is real, what is reality, a way of thinking about reality, which in fact uh, it's at the basis of his equation and which is unbelievably simple and beautiful and convincing and we all already sort of have in our mind, which is the following. There is a huge empty space, right, uh, which has no special direction up or down, they're all the same, it's uh, the same all over. And so this is, a, this is a sort of tablet which is supposed to represent the space. So it's equal and goes for all over for infinity. Okay? So that's the stage. And uh, on this stage, uh, time passes for this space, time. Time passes, equal since ever, forever. And all the thing we see uh, can just be thought as bodies or particles move around and they move straight in space forever um, until something uh, pushes or pulls them, forces, Newton forces, and uh, these forces are generated by nothing else but other particles. So that's it. Um, space, times, and particles. There are curvature, there's curvature space, this curvature can be so big that it you can make a hole and that's black holes and so on and so forth. It's not just space that curves, I've been cutting short uh, the angles here a little bit, it's space-time. So it's not just the extension of space, but it's the passage of time which are bent. What does this mean? Well, let me give you a simple picture of that. So uh, take a clock and take another one and they uh, make sure they indicate the same time, they do, okay? Now lower one, keep it lower for a while, wait a moment, then bring it up, look at them closely, and if they're good enough clocks, these are not good enough clocks, this is my <laughs> grandfather, but if these are good enough clocks, they don't indicate the same time. The one who has been lower is late with respond the one that has been up which means the times go slower here and, and upper here. This is, uh, this is something Einstein understood 100 years ago, but now it's not some strange idea of Einstein. It's something which is verified in the laboratory pretty easily and regularly, even a few uh, half a meter of... of, of, uh, of um. So time doesn't pass the same. Time passes slower, down, faster here. If you think a moment, the, reason, the actual reason for which things fall, okay, they don't go straight, they, they come down, is because time passes a different speed up here than here. So it's more convenient time-wise to go up and down rather than go this way. Which if you think is the same reason for which you, when you fly from London to New York, and if you look at the map, you have a map of the Earth, right? And here's London, here's New York, and then you look at what the airplane does, it does that. So why the stupid pilot goes always up there, well, because the Earth is round, so if you're gonna if you're gonna <coughs> wanna go from east to west, uh, it's convenient to go north because the distance between the west uh, uh, meridians is smaller north. So this is actually shorter than this. The same reason for which this is shorter than this. Space time is curved, so it's convenient to go up and down <coughs> rather than go straight.
example, the common sense view is that we don't know what time is. Um, and uh, the common sense view is, is, is actually what goes back to Isaac Newton. And, and for many people who haven't taken a course in relativity theory, we think we haven't progressed from there. So there's this cosmic clock that ticks by the seconds, the minutes, the hours at the same rate for everyone. Uh, and although we have our own, own subjective view of time, that if, if you're enjoying this hour, it'll go by very quickly. If you're bored, you know, the time will, will drag. But you know that's so Fo the way... Focus on the former. Focus on the former, absolutely. <laughs> well, th there's no danger. But we know that's our own subjective view of time. Actually, in 1905, Einstein published his special theory of relativity, where he showed that that view of time is wrong. Time isn't an absolute. It's not something abstract, something that we have invented, or something that we have no control over. Time is m m more tangible than that. It's tangible in the, in the way that space is tangible. Now, in space, we know we, we have access to three dimensions of space, and we can move forwards and backwards, up and down, left and right. In time, we are constrained to moving in one direction. So we think, in, 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 certainly in physics, as time as having an arrow, a direction. I remember one of my um, finest moments was when I was doing my PhD and I was looking up some, some, some papers in the, in the university library and I came across one of Stephen Hawking's papers, so this is mid-80s, uh, uh, where he talks about the arrows of time and the direction of time. And how can you define the direction of time? Is past and future just something we've invented? Um, and actually, in his paper, there are several definitions of time, and, and he then goes on to point out that one way of defining time is in the direction in which the universe is expanding. So the past, forget human memory, what if humans had never evolved? Why, what if there was no life in the universe? Would there still be time? Yes, of course, there would be time. It's part of the fabric of what the universe is, the, the, um, space-time, as, as Einstein calls it. Uh, and so Hawking said, well, if we define the direction of time as going from the Big Bang onwards. So the Big Bang, smaller universe is in the past. The direction of time is the direction of the expansion of the universe. But if our psychological arrow of time, the way we think of part, remembering the past and looking to the future, is in the same direction as that, how would we know if the universe is actually contracting? Maybe the universe is getting smaller, but it's because our arrow of time is always pointing in the direction of expansion of time. And, and the first two or three pages of this paper I followed, and then he got into the maths. And Stephen Hawking's maths wasn't the same as my maths. It, it depends on what area of physics you're in. And I lost him there. But I was aware that he'd made a mistake about the arrow of time. And I remember making some notes. And then remember a few years later reading Brief History of Time, where he conceded he'd made a mistake. And I remember reading this on the train and smiling, grinning to myself that I, I proved somehow that Stephen Hawking had made, made a mistake. But, but it points to the fact that even modern uh, physics doesn't really understand quite how time fits into to our theories of, of, of the universe. Relativity theory tells us that time can be squeezed and stretched. There's no absolute time. Time depends on the observer. If, if two people are traveling at, at high speed relative to each other, close to the speed of light, they will measure time at flowing at different rates. They will see each other's clocks running slower. There is no absolute present now. It depends on your frame of reference. And yet, the other great theory of modern physics, quantum mechanics, doesn't really describe time in, in this more complete way. In quantum mechanics, time is just what's called a parameter. It's just a way of ensuring how things change, cranking the handle from past to future. And, and one of the big questions in modern physics is how do we reconcile Einstein's theory of relativity with quantum mechanics? Because until then, we won't have a correct theory of time. But we do know a lot more about time than maybe some of the philosophers might argue we do. It, it is much more than psychological time. It's much more than just how we care to define it. There's an absoluteness to time, according to Einstein, that exists whether or not humans care to pontificate and philosophize about it. Now, Leibniz, I think, on one thing, I believe Leibniz was right, basically, at the most basic level, on time. So, he, he, as space, he said, space is the order of coexisting things, and I replaced that by 
space is the order of coexisting facts. And Leibniz said, time is just the succession of coexisting things. And I would say the succession of coexisting facts. And it's very easy to see what he meant by that. If I have a universe which just consists of three particles, I can imagine that in one instant of time, they look like that. And I want you only to think of the shape that counts, just the shape. The two angles determine the shape of, of, of those three particles there. That, that's, that's one there. Uh, and then I may be given, I give one to Hugh, then I give him the next one, and it's a different shape. But I could give you all intermediate ones that go continuously one into the other. And just by the successive shapes, I could order them in, in, in an order, just using the information in the successive shapes. What I can't do is put a direction onto it. Nothing in that we know in physics actually puts a direction on and says which one goes in, in which order. But I think for me, the, the Leibniz is spot on that you can really think of, 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 the, of the universe as just being successive shapes, one after another, like that. And in fact, if I were to throw them down in a confused heap there and shuffle them all, nothing is lost. The information is there. It's just like cutting up a movie into individual stills. I can put them back in, in, the, in the right order, and if it's a, a proper movie telling a proper story that we're familiar with, there will be a, a one direction in which you play it. We've all seen these reversed films where people come out of swimming pools backwards. <laughs> the film was taken as they dive in and then you just run the film backwards. But there is, uh, this is the problem of the origin of the arrow of time. Now, I would say, I think there is a notion of now. It is just, so to speak, that the universe is like this now. That is our now. But the universe is now different, and this is our now, now. I don't, I don't see, Einstein said he was terribly, the reason why Einstein was worried about there's no place for now was because he denied a notion of simultaneity. But I think there is a representation of Einstein's theory where you restore a notion of simultaneity, but you take out size and you only look at shapes. Um, so I, I think it will be possible to, to talk about now. And I think Einstein's great concern about there being no place for now in the modern worldview is just mistaken. Uh, it's always, we are in a particular now, and it's, it's constantly different. It's a wonderful world. What we mean by becoming, or what we mean by to happen, is for something indefinite to become definite. This is what we call an event. So Einstein and special general relativity like to talk about events. Events for Einstein in classical physics, non-quantum physics, are where two particles collide or a, or a photon of light is absorbed or emitted by a particle. That's an event for Einstein. And what we're saying is that the events are notable because they're where something indefinite say the position of the electron or the spin of the electron became definite. We call that an event. Only the becoming, the transition from indefinite to definite is real. So when I say real, I mean fundamental and real. I mean present at the most fundamental level of description. Let me just read that again. Only the becoming, the transition from indefinite to definite is real. So we're saying, well, you will see what we're saying. To exist is to trace a transitory event. And these transitions are what we call now, the present. And the fact that we experience the present and not the future and not the past is a consequence of this. To exist is to trace the transitory event where something indefinite becomes definite. Hence, everything that is real is real in a particular moment the moment it becomes definite, the present moment. And we may have events which become present, which become definite together. So we call this the group of events, which in some sense are present with respect to each other, or co-present, the present moment. Now, these events exist for some definite duration, and that's a long story you can ask me about, and then give rise to subsequent events, 
which makes up subsequent present moments, which again exists for a finite duration and then cease to exist and give rise to the next set of moments, of events. And this is how a world based only on the distinction between indefinite and definite may define also causal structure. Causal structure is a word we physicists love. It means what events cause what events. Once an event that was indefinite becomes definite, it cannot reverse and go back to becoming indefinite. Once an event happens, it cannot be made to unhappen. There is a one way nature of reality, the events, then the things become definite that were indefinite, other things become definite that were indefinite, and so on and so forth. This makes the history of the world, and it's got a big, people worry about where does the arrow of time come from. That we believe is where the arrow of time comes from. Each event, each becoming into definiteness, happens for a reason. These reasons come from just prior events. And we want to get more specific. Energy and momentum are, pa- are real and part of the world, and they're passed on from event to event to event. So there's a kind of network of who passed on so much energy to who, who passed it on to who, who passed it on to who. And each moment, each of those events was real. The ones in the past, we'll get to them, but no longer. And the ones in the future, no, not yet. So the view of the, now I talked before about the view of an event. I've I've been talking for four or five years about this. The view of an event is you think of what that event knows or what it could know if it was somehow a sentient being about the causes that made it, that is the endowments of energy and momentum and maybe other kinds of charges coming from the events just to the past of it. And that, those views are the partial views that I talked about at the beginning of what the universe is composed of. There's a present moment, things happen, they become definite, and the structure of the world as it propagates through time is the structure of who caused who, who and whose energy endowed whose energy. And if I'm sounding a bit, um, Wacky, there's a whole mathematical framework behind this that we developed with Melina Cortez and others called Energetic Causal Sets, but I'm not presenting it. My job here is not to present that, but this is a kind of interpretation of that mathematics. The direction from indefinite to definite gives the universe an arrow of time. Events do not persist. They have no past apart from the endowments they inherit. And all that exists with definite properties is the views of the events in the present moment. Everything, so the world recreates itself in every moment. There's not a building here that's been here forever. There's a building that every moment recreates itself by the events of the last moment giving rise to the events of the present moment. Every structure, every force, every planet, every star is continually recreating itself. Everything we see around us exists or did just exist is gone in the flash of an eye. There's no need for a past because the past can't affect us. There's nothing under our feet. The past is gone. So I have this rather interesting absolute structure in Minkowski space-time. It turns out that all observers have to agree on which events Uh, light from us can reach and which events uh, can emit light and reach us with that light. So this light cone structure, picture the following. I suddenly sort of, I have something that creates flashes of light and I just flash, so they go out three dimensions all around me and I suddenly flash light. There's a whole set of points that that light will reach, right? I mean, it's going to move very fast, but, you know, a tiny portion of a second later it will have reached the outside of this room and then suppose it outside this room is transparent, it will continue on going. So there's a whole set of events that I can reach with a flash of light, and likewise, there's a whole set of events that right now light is hitting me from. Now, I haven't mentioned this, but it also follows from the structure of special relativity that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Right? So it turns out that there's this kind of cone in space-time. The inside of those cones are all of the things that I can actually affect or travel to, and all of the things that can affect me or travel to me. 
So I do have this kind of useful structure in Minkowski space-time, but what I don't have is a matter of fact about how, amongst the events that light, which has a finite speed, can't reach me from, light would have to travel infinitely fast in some reference frame to get to me from there. It can't do that. Um, so I can't really communicate with that event. And so there just isn't a matter of facts, according to special relativity, about whether that event is simultaneous with me or not. How I choose that slice, that hypersurface of simultaneity on that diagram, how I choose that slice or whether I choose to tilt it with the light cone depends on my reference frame. Um, one of the reasons why that space-time formulation is so helpful is that it makes it clear what kinds of features should be relative to a reference frame and what kind of features should be absolute. So I'm going to end up talking a bit about looking for structures that are invariant with respect to your reference frame. And that means things you and I can agree on, even if I'm on the moving train. Um, so generally, different observers aren't going to agree on how much time elapses between two events, because if you don't, event, don't agree on which things are simultaneous, you're not going to agree on how much time elapses between two events, and your clocks can run differently to mine, and all of the rest of it. You're not going to agree on how far apart things are, because your rods are contracted relative to mine. Um, but there are some things we'll agree on. It turns out there are some absolutes in the space-time, and one of those things is what you might think of as the space-time distance between two points. You get the space-time distance by squaring all distances and then naughtily subtracting a function of time. So time is a little bit different. And then you square root all of that, and you get the space-time distance. And actually, it turns out that that really simple little bit of mathematics, it's actually something we geometrically call a metric, encodes all of the structure that's in the light cone. So it turns out that if you have two events in space-time that a light ray could travel between, they must be, though that only a light ray could travel between, let's start with this. So you can have events that are far enough apart that only something moving at 3 times 78 meters per second could get from one to the other. If they're like that, then they're light-like separated, and the interval between them uh, is zero. Slightly oddly, this is a weird kind of distance. It turns out that things that are separated by light rays count as zero distance in my space-time. Events on the light cone are light-like separated from the origin event. So all of those events that I can reach with my flash of light are light-like separated from me. They have zero space-time distance. That's an odd feature of this geometry. Um, if two events are such that something travelling slower than the speed of light, so, so some material body, um, could pass between them, they're time-like separated. So the se sequence of events that I can reach by you know, going for a run from, um, from now are time-like separated from me. And it turns out I can tell they're time-like separated by calculating that interval. And if that interval is negative, um, that distance is negative, it turns out it's time-like separated. And likewise, we can have events that are space-like separated. So no material body could pass between them, but I could, say, send out a ruler to connect them up. Um, I have space-like separate events, and the square of the interval between them is positive. And those are the events that lie outside the light cone. So if we go back to looking at our light cone, all the events on the surface of the cone are light-like separated from me. All the events inside the cone are time-like separated from me. And all of these things out here are space-like separated. And one of the consequences of special relativity is that there's always a reference frame in which I can view any space-like separated event from me as being simultaneous if I want to. I want to uh, use this concept of color to introduce uh, the idea of a color space. This will allow us to uh, visualize what extra dimensions look like and give us a new perspective on uh, many on uh, some basic concepts that we know we've learned in recent times uh, are at the foundation of how the physical world works, local symmetry. <clears throat> okay, so this is a picture of what I showed you before, a different way of representing the idea that we can get uh, all the different colors as mixtures of three. This is called the color cube. Uh, and along the different axes are different intensities of blue, green, and red. Okay, if all of them are turned up, uh, you get white. Uh, if you just go along this axis and leave the other two zero, you get pure blue and so forth. And this represents, if you could see the interior, look at it, it would represent all the different perceptive colors Every point inside the cube looks different, and everything that can be seen as a color is somewhere in this cube. So the space of colors makes a three-dimensional space, and the space of perceived colors 
makes a three-dimensional space in this very uh, natural way. Okay, so now uh, you may have heard that physicists like to think, uh, speculate about there possibly being extra dimensions, additional spatial dimensions. Uh, and you may, in your own life, have to deal with data sets that have many different variables. So it would be nice to be able to move in different dimensions, to, rep to use different dimensions, to plot them all on, on a common at the same time. Uh, wouldn't it be marvelous if we could visualize extra dimensions? Wouldn't that be fantastic? What would it be like to see extra dimensions? Well, let's think about what you look at what you're seeing when you look at a computer screen or what a computer is doing when it's outputting some output. But if you had to program it and tell it what it's, got, it's supposed to do, what would you need to do? Well, you would have to tell on each pixel on the screen, so each X and Y coordinate, uh, at every time, which point on the color cube to display, which, what, uh, what the color of that, the perceived color of that pixel should be. So when you're looking at a computer screen or when you're programming a computer, you're working in a six dimensional space time. If you look at the numbers that describe the situation, there's a time, there's a position, and there's the amount of red, green, and blue. Inside the pro computer program, these are all very much on the same footing. They're just five different numbers. So if you want to know what a five-dimensional space and a six-dimensional space-time look like, you're looking at them whenever you look at a, a computer pro, uh, screen. Uh, Matisse, especially, was at least intuitively aware of this concept of a color space. And in many, many paintings, played with the idea of rotating different colors in different places into one another, as you can see here. This anticipates a kind of transformation that's fundamental in modern physics, called a local symmetry transformation, where you make different kinds of transformations at different places. So here, uh, Matisse is using the concept of local color symmetry uh, that's, that really only entered physics in a big way in the uh, third quarter of the 20th century. There's Pascal's triangle. I, I take it most people have seen this at some time or other, and you can see that, for example, the six in the middle is the sum of the two threes above it, and the three is the sum of the one and the two above it and so on. Um, there's a somewhat less familiar, wasn't familiar to me structure, which is a kind of th three-dimensional structure called Pascal square-based pyramid, but it works just the same way. I'm gonna stack stuff up and put number a number, the number one at the top, and then just count as it goes down, the number in each box will be the sum of the numbers in the boxes above it. Um, but now I'm stacking cubes on cubes in such a way that each cube has four cubes below it. So it's easier to, to see it, right, than to describe it. You can see that's what it looks like. You've got a one at the top. Each of the four in the next layer, the four reds are all ones. Then you get the next layer down and you have ones in the corners, twos in the middle and four at the bottom. And then you can continue to go down, filling out this Pascal's pyramid. We can look at what it looks the fifth level down. These are what the numbers, if we cut through it horizontally and we looked at the fifth level down, these are the numbers. Now, if you just kind of look at this, it has two really, really interesting, important structures to it. One is that along the edges, those numbers are just the same ones you got out of Pascal's triangle. So you've got one, four, six, four, one along the edges. And if we go back here, you see one, four, six, four, one along Pascal's triangle. And in the interior, you notice the whole thing looks like a multiplication table. So you get all the numbers in the interior by just multiplying 
the numbers, the, the corresponding numbers at the edges. So you get the 24 by multiplying four and six, and you get the 36 by multiplying six and six and so on. Now we have a kind of fancy fact that uh, you just have to trust me on, which is that as you go further and further down Pascal's triangle, those, that set of numbers, so 14641, and then 151051, and so on. The structure of those numbers, as you go farther and farther down, becomes closer and closer to what's called a Gaussian normal distribution, which is the function that I've written here, f of x, some normalization number, e to the minus one half x squared. It, it has, it's that bell curve shape that everybody's familiar with. So the numbers out of Pascal's triangle are not exactly that, but if you stay away from the far edges, they, they become closer and closer to being proportional to this distribution, this Gaussian distribution. That's just a mathematical fact. Now, let's put those together. Let's suppose we go many, 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 many levels down our pyramid and we pick a point somewhere in the center of the pyramid, not toward the edges. And we can say, we can sort of give it by its row and column, X and Y, only we're gonna count X and Y so that the very middle is zero. Plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, minus three, and so on. So every, everything will get a, a kind of address that's a row and column. And what will the path connectivity be from the top down to the point x, y. Well, approximately, now we're, we're plugging in my approximation here, I'm plugging in my Gaussian distribution. And remember, I just need to multiply the, there's, I'll get a Gaussian distribution for x and a Gaussian distribution for y, and I multiply them together. So you get this equation at the bottom, and it tells you that the total number of paths that go down to the point x, y will be approximately some number n squared times e to the minus one half x squared plus y squared. That's our equation. The really important thing about that equation, if we go down to some level and we cut through horizontally at that level, it tells us that the path connectivity is approximately proportional to x squared plus y squared. So if x squared plus y squared equals x prime squared plus y prime squared, if they're about the same number, then you have the same level of path connectivity. But x squared plus y squared equals constant is the equation for Euclidean circle. That's the equation. So it tells you that at the level of path connectivity in the space time, these Euclidean circles naturally emerge. If the physics is sensitive to path connectivity, even though the fundamental structure is discrete and doesn't have continuous linear directions or anything else, the Euclidean geometry will naturally emerge. And so this gives me some hope to think that this is a live possibility for how to think about actual space time. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.